we are starting in sort of a different part of a series this morning. Uh, one way that we used to describe our church and actually would describe our family of churches, Sovereign Grace Ministries, one of the ways we described ourselves, we were, we were essentially reformed with a significant charismatic dimension. And when we said that 25 years ago and 30 years ago, that was fairly unusual, okay, that there'd be anybody that would be sort of believing in Reformed doctrines, the contours of Reformed doctrine, and also have a charismatic expression. And that was a very strange bedfellow. In fact, people said, I didn't even know that could exist, let alone that it would exist. And it's not as uncommon as, as it was as people are embracing both, but it was very uncommon. Now, the last three weeks, what we did is we focused on the first part of that, that we, were, we are essentially reformed. Now, I realize you might, you're guests or you're here visiting and maybe you still didn't get all that. What does that mean, essentially reformed? And are we believing a man system? No, we're believing what we clearly believe Scripture teaches and we're representing that. But here's what it means for us to be a sensory reform. A sensory reform means we emphasize the sovereignty of God in the saving of sinners. That it's God's activity, and it was his intent from the beginning. So we heard today the promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, that not only would he be a great nation, but that all nations throughout the world, through all time, would be blessed through Abraham. There's a promise there, and we believe that promise then was fulfilled in the coming of Christ. To where the gospel and the salvation was offered to all people. That all people had the privilege to be called God's people if they place faith in Christ. So it emphasizes the sovereignty of God and the saving of sinners. That's a doctrine that we believe exalts God's grace, that this is his action, and exalts God's glory and our salvation. And it's a If we understand it rightly, it's not only a humbling doctrine for us, it is a comforting and assuring doctrine for us that God would choose to set his affections on people like us. Now, the next four weeks, what we're going to focus on, we're going to focus our attention on the second part of that statement, not the essential reform, but the significant charismatic dimension. Now, we don't call it that anymore, charismatic, because charismatic is a word that carries a fair amount of baggage, by the way, rightly so. Okay? I did not come from a charismatic background at all. Okay? I was Presbyterian, and we were known as the frozen chosen. Right? And so we had our doctrine right, and our hands were in our pocket, and we didn't smile much. Now, actually, I have a wonderful background, and I love my Presbyterian background. It was actually full of joy, uh, relationships, so I, I don't have critique that way, but that's a caricature of it. But, but this charismatic thing, well, that, for me, I had met charismatics, and the ones I had met convinced me I didn't want to be one. And what I saw in meetings convinced me I didn't want to go to their meetings. And so what was this? And I remember when I first started to go to Covenant Fellowship Church, and this church that was having vibrant worship, and I thought, well, they're singing good songs, they seem to be doctrinally centered, and they're preaching God's word, and they seem actually to be people of humility. But I watched and asked a lot of questions in my first year. I watched intently, and I asked questions. Intently. Sometimes probably arrogantly and argumentatively. But I wanted to know, you know what was this significant charismatic dimension? And what did that mean for me. Now, today we don't call it charismatic dimension. We now call it, we are uh, continuationists, we're continuationists in our pneumatology. It just sounds mo- so much better, um, <laughs> right? Okay, that sounds respectable. Pneumatology, if it's a word, I don't know what it means. It must be a respectable word, okay? <laughs> That's just the study of the Holy Spirit, by the way. That's what pneumatology means. So we're continuationists. And here's what that means we believe in the filling of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the activity of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the empowering of the Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit as they are biblically defined and expressed. And we believe in the broad work of the Spirit. We want to be a Spirit-filled people. 
And if you read the book of Acts, and if your subtitles, if you look at, by the way, subtitles are put there by men. They're not, they're not inspired. But if you say Acts, often it says the Acts of the Apostles. That's probably a misnomer. It should be going, this is the ongoing work of redemption of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit through the local church. It's just, that's longer. <laughs> so they just call it Acts of the Apostles. But this was a Spirit-empowered church. They were told not to witness until the Spirit came upon them and filled them with power. Folks, we believe we need the same. So this is going to be our charismatic, our continuationist dimension. Now, I think this is a distinctive that is easy for us to drift from. I really do. We can drift from this distinctive. It can be easier. It's not that it's not important, but it can be easier to, ve to develop and hold and protect theological convictions. They're respectable, right? I've thought through my theology. I've got my doctrine, and I hold to that. And by the way, that's very important. We don't want to ever diminish doctrine and theological convictions. But you can hold them, and you hold them close, but you're not always interacting. Once you've got them, you've got them. That's different with the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of the Trinity of God. And therefore, since he's a person, it's a relationship that we need to cultivate or it will drift. Now, I may not always, I, I wish I could say, I always perfectly follow all my convictions. I don't. I hold my convictions deeply and dearly. And I don't waver in what I hold that way. But I don't have to cultivate them daily. But in relationship with the Holy Spirit, I do. And I can drift from doing that. I can drift. And maybe you drift as well. Anthony Hokema said the following, theologian Anthony Hokema said the following, being continually filled with the Spirit is, in fact, the challenge of a lifetime and the challenge of each new day. So tomorrow, God wants to fill you with power. God wants to do things. And that's also a challenge to experience. So, folks, we don't want to drift from this distinctive. And by the way, I think the other thing that can cause us to drift is there have been abuses around the Holy Spirit. Haven't there? Sure. So, you know what? Let's just stay with sound doctrine. It's safer. The moment you introduce the Holy Spirit, things might get weird. People might get offended. It's just, you know, it's just a challenge, a problem. So let's just not even touch it. Well, folks, that's not a biblical response. We don't, in a sense, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Abuses have, surround, have abounded and surround the Holy Spirit. Subjectivism that highlights experience. That, so what I subjectively feel now becomes authoritative. Spiritual arrogance has been known to be associated with charismatics. Well, God told me. And when I have folks tell me that, it's not that I don't believe they're not being led by God, but how do you argue with someone and say, well, God told me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, now I'm arguing with God. I'm not even trying to give you wisdom anymore. It makes the conversation a difficult conversation. So there are been, there have been abuses and misuses of the Holy Spirit, subjectivism, that I felt something, and, or I'm looking to feel something, and, and I've got to go someplace where I have the next feeling experience, and you start to chase experience. And actually, it's emotional experience. Or you become... Spiritually arrogant, and that certainly has marked some things around charismatic things in the Holy Spirit. And by the way, there's been arrogance on the other side, too. Uh, arrogance seems to be common to men, so wherever man is, there's probably some expressions of arrogance. But also abuses around poor theology. So when I heard of charismatics, you know what my association was? It was a natural and not a wrong association, was health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. That's how I knew them. All the, teach, all the preachers I saw on TV, that's what they portrayed. They all had weird hair. I mean, like, like man, where'd you create that hair? They did weird things, usually, you know, whipping around coats and smacking people on foreheads and, 
you know, no wonder they fell down. They're hurt. You know, they got a concussion protocol um, is where they're going. And, and those kinds of things I saw, I thought, well, that's bad theology. The health and wealth gospel, folks, if it's a gospel at all, it's a distorted gospel. And that's probably the kindest thing I can say about it. It's, it's distorted, if not actually in a false gospel, completely false gospel. So here's what we want to do over the next four weeks. We want to give you a biblical understanding, okay, a biblical understanding of the Spirit that leads to greater experience with the Spirit, a biblical understanding of the Spirit that hopefully will lead to a greater experience with the Spirit. And experience is an important part of this. So if you'd open up your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at God's Word. I've entitled this morning's message, Blessed Assurance, after the great hymn. And here's the main point. The Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer, works in the life of the believer to bring great assurance they belong to God. Now, the Holy Spirit does more than that, but that is an essential thing the Holy Spirit does. He works in the life of the believer to bring great assurance they belong to God. God wants to do something. He wants to accomplish something through his Holy Spirit in your life. And I trust he will work to that end this morning. So Romans chapter 8, hear the word of the Lord. Beginning in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let's pray. Lord, we have read your holy word. These are your words, and may they speak to us clearly. And Lord, I ask for your spirit to come and fill us. Well, we don't want to go through a Sunday where we just gather because it's what we do, and it's the right thing to do, and we have convictions about being in church. But Lord, I ask that your spirit would quicken things, enlighten, enlighten things, God. Empower us, affect us, rescue us, invade our hearts this morning. And that we would experience your presence among us through your spirit. So please help me to handle your words accurately, Lord. That my words would follow yours and not precede them. They would be in submission to yours, and they'd be helpful to yours. God, please do that, I pray, for the glory of your Son and the good of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are again in the political season of elections, and I do encourage you to vote um, on on the elections that are coming up in, in a little over a week. So this political season of elections, and typically uh, politicians during election season make promises. They tend to make a lot of promises. Now, actually, there's two things they do. They tend to run down their opponent and tend to make promises. Um, Some of the promises that politicians make, they don't mean, and they really have no intention to keep. But they're smart people, and they recognize their audience, and they recognize what's going to sell to their audience. They're not dumb. They hire smart people that help market them. And they go, well, what audience am I speaking to? And how do I speak to the needs of that audience and tell them, in one sense, what they want to hear? 
So they'll tell things like that, and they'll make promises that they don't always mean to keep. Now, they'll make some promises they do mean to keep, but here's the other problem. So sometimes they make promises they don't mean, and here's the other problem. Sometimes they make promises they can't keep. You know why? They don't have absolute power. So I could sincerely believe what I'm telling this audience if I was running for office, that if you elect me, this is what I'm going to do. And yet if I walk into a political process, there's all sorts of people that will oppose what I think integrity, honesty, common sense, any kind of intellectual honesty demands that we do. If we have a reasonable argument, you will certainly come to the same conclusion. And yet that doesn't happen often. So they make promises sometimes they don't mean, and sometimes they make promises they can't keep because they lack the power. And that goes all the way to the Oval Office, to the president, of every president in American history, of every Congress in American history, of every elected official, probably at local levels of officials, where they've made promises they don't mean to keep or they can't keep, because they lack the power. Now, here's the good news. God is not like that. In fact, he is the opposite of that. What God promises, he means. He's never selling you something. And even here when he talks about, oh, there's a great inheritance if you believe. A great inheritance. That inheritance includes eternal life, a new body, God himself, the world, the earth is your inheritance. How oh, that's your inheritance. But you know what? If you suffer. God's very honest. He does not make promises that he doesn't keep. Whatever he promises, he means. And folks, whatever he promises, he keeps. Because he has the power to keep it. There is no promise that God did not mean, and no promise that God will not fulfill. Not one. Now that should raise certain questions. Right? As you're interacting with the Lord and saying, but I want it. Right? There's a disconnect between what I was hoping for and, and what I believe God said, sir, and there's this, con- there's this distance. See, God hasn't promised you an easy life. He hasn't promised that you get all the things you ask for. He has promised he will do good, that he is sovereign, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he will work all things together for your good. And he is fulfilling all those promises. He has the power to fulfill his promises. He's not in any way inept. Now, one of the great promises in the Old Testament was the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is an Old Testament promise to the Jewish nation. Listen to what it says in Joel chapter 2, and now it's going to go way beyond that. Listen to what it says in Joel chapter uh, 2, verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh... Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. See what he's doing? He goes, everybody's going to get this. This is not for the spiritual elite. This is not just for leaders. God's going to pour out a spirit in all people. Servants, yes. Men, women, young people. Across the board. God's pouring out a spirit. And then in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, a similar thing is said. Hear the Lord saying this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. In other words, there's something that's going to happen with this new covenant. It's not going to be the law written on stone that we look to to try to obey, that we fail. It's going to be written in your heart. There's going to be something internal, not external, that's going to lead you forward. These are promises from the Old Testament to find their fulfillment in the New Testament through Christ with the coming of the Spirit. 
Folks, this is a promise then that Jesus reaffirms in John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That gives you one of the things the Holy Spirit does. He will teach you all things. So, by the way, anytime you read God's word and it makes sense to you, that's an evidence of the Spirit of God at work in you. Otherwise, it would make no sense. If you don't think there's people that have gone to crusades with Billy Graham and other great speakers, Timothy Keller, smart, brilliant men, John Piper, brilliant and, and just so emotionally connected into his audience and and they've heard a word from God and they're like the Christians in their lounge are saying wow I'm so glad this person's here this is certainly going to have an effect on them you walk out amazed by what you heard and they walk out and say I didn't get it it didn't make any sense to me yeah he seems passionate <laughs> seems like a good guy it seems like he really believes it sincerely but I just didn't get it why do you get anything because that's the Spirit of God that's teaching us, causing us to remember things. And they make sense to us. So if there's this great promise in the Old Testament, Jesus reaffirms the promise in the New Testament, and actually says of this promise, it's better that he go to heaven so the Spirit could come. Now, can you imagine that? It's better that Jesus is saying, it's better that I not stay so the Spirit can come. Now, if we said, if we had a choice between Jesus and the Spirit, we'd be like, we'll take Jesus probably, right? Yeah, I want to see Jesus. And certainly there's something good in that, the longing to see our Savior. But Jesus said, no, no, it's better that I go. It's so much going to be so much better that the Spirit comes because the Spirit will be everywhere present. He'll be in you, whereas my body, I'm limited to where I am. So if I'm here in this church, it means I'm not there in another church physically. But through the Spirit, he's everywhere. So this is not, this folks, this is a great promise that God gives in the Old Testament, Jesus reaffirms in the New Testament, and then we see function and happen on the day of Pentecost in, the, in really the birth of the church. The Spirit comes in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Those men are told to wait in the upper room, to not go and witness, to not tell anybody the good news. Even though they've seen Christ crucified, seen him risen, for them, they have no question. We, we, we believe the resurrection. They saw the resurrection. And actually, Jesus says, blessed are those who don't see, who believe your testimony. They saw it. They knew. I mean, if this was not true, they, they would have known it's not true. Which means they would have been dying for lie. They'd been saying, well, we're just going to act like Jesus rose from the dead. We're going to tell everybody that. But we know he didn't. We never saw him. And by the way, we're going to get killed for that lie. We're going to die gruesome deaths for that lie. We're going to receive the scorn of most men because we're promoting that. No, no, they knew it was true. They saw him crucified. Their hearts were crushed. Their hopes were dashed. They were fearful. And then these men experienced the resurrection of Christ. And they, oh, they know it's to be true. They didn't imagine it. They didn't wish for it. They weren't trying to promulgate, promulgate a religion and a system. They had a living Savior, and they wanted to tell the world about that living Savior. But, and Jesus commissions them when he goes to heaven, go into the world, be witnesses, the great commission. But, he goes, but wait, not yet, because you need the Holy Spirit. The truth of what you've seen isn't enough. You need to be empowered by the Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit within you, and that's how I'll be with you to the end of the age as well. And then that church becomes a spirit-empowered church in Acts 2 and becomes an evangelizing church. Folks, why do we want to be a spirit-empowered church? So we can also be an evangelizing church, that we take the good news out to others. It doesn't stay within these walls and this building. Now, folks, there are many ways that we experience the Spirit, many ways. This series will not cover all the ways that we uh, experience the Spirit. But one essential way we experience the Spirit is through the assurance He brings. It's through the assurance He brings. So let's look at our text. 
Let's look at our text. Romans chapter 8. And I want to draw your attention to verses 15 and 16. Again, hear God's word. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back in the fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So here's the first point. The Spirit bears witness we are chil- witness that we are children of God. That's what he does, that we're God's children. He bears witness to that. And, and this is something he wants us to have. God, folks, this is kind of the Lord. God wants you to have assurance. He does not want you to be forever plagued with the question of, of if I'm really a Christian. Now, by the way, if you're not really a Christian and that question's plaguing you, that's the Spirit of God quickening things in you. But we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ. You believe Christ died for your sins. You believe Christ rose, that he is exalted and, and reigning in heaven and will come again and we will be with him. You believe that. You've cast yourself upon Christ. Well, well God wants you to be assured that you're saved. You might say, well, well, that's obvious. You know what? That's a struggle for many. That can be a struggle for many. Am I really saved? Am I really God's child? Do I really belong to him? And there can be probably different causes to those questions. These questions not continually, but from time to time, tormented me in my teen years, even up through my early 20s. Am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? Do I really belong to God? And folks, when those questions were tormenting me, Josh referenced the dark night of the soul. There isn't a darker night of the soul than that. There's been other challenges I've had, maybe other trials I've gone through, but there's no darker night for my soul than when I was wrestling with, am I saved? Am I really a child of God? Am I really a Christian? And if I'm really a Christian, why? And then you fill in the blank. And that question tormented me. At different times and sometimes of great desperation. And I'm grateful for how God doesn't struggle with our questions. He loves us and is patient and forbearing. And he clings to us so tightly in those dark moments of our soul. Because part of my dark moment is also saying I don't believe things that, about God. I don't believe he can love someone like me. There's things that you start, actually, you're indicting God along the way. And even in those, even my unbelief, that's a sin God died for. And I, oh, Lord, you were the father that does not let go. You're the father whose son is not, is not believing that the father loves him. And it's just sort of going off rails. And you are still the father. And you still love your boy. And it's through eventually patience and God's forbearance and and some truth I needed to hear and understandings that I needed to gather. I believed I was saved in all those years. (laughs) But I was not enjoying insurance. I was tormented by the lack of of assurance. And if you've ever been there, you know what it feels like. And many people get there at some point in their lives. See, God wants you to know that you are saved, that you belong to him, that you are a child of his. And he wants you to enjoy knowing it. So what's he do? The spirit brings assurance to us. It's the spirit that's within us, that cries out, Abba, Father. It's the spirit that bears witness with our spirit. So these two things start to say, yes, I am. Yes, you are. And they bear witness that we belong to God. 
But the question is, how does the Spirit bear witness? So I can tell you, he bears witness, and you can say, thank you, and you can walk out of here saying, well, but how? You got me charged up that he wants to, but I'm walking away with, but I still feel something, and I don't know how. Well, this text actually helps us understand how does the Spirit bring that assurance? He brings that assurance. He bears witness to us, but how does he bear witness? How does he bring the assurance? So that takes us to our second point, and here it is. The Spirit leads us into war against our sin. This is one of the ways that God brings assurance to you, that you're actually, you actually belong to him. Look at verses 12 through 14. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh. So according to the flesh. In other words, you don't have to live to yourself anymore. It's not about your dreams anymore. You've been liberated from your dream. And actually, your dream wasn't big enough. Because it would have died with you had you achieved your dream. It would have died with you. So it's small. I'm going to do something much more. So look at it, it says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So if you live according to your will and your dream and your independence from God, you will die. And you will go to hell. It's not God's desire. That's why he sent his son to die for sins, to liberate us, to set us free, to bring us forgiveness and eternal life. For you've lived according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. How are we led by the Spirit? Well, here's how the Spirit leads us. He leads us in the war against our sin. The Spirit's our champion. He leads us in the war against our sin. We begin to hate our sin. We seek to kill our sin. So things like lust, pride, Anger, impatience, sloth, greed, gossip. These things become, start to become ugly to us. At one point, they weren't ugly. We had no compulsion. We would gossip meanly and walk away with no conscience. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, there's a check coming. I just spoke ill. Gossiped. I lost it. I was angry. I was impatient. I was harsh. I'm living for my own good. And those things start to trouble our soul. Our, our souls become troubled over our sins. Where at one point, when you're dead in your sin, you're not troubled. Because <laughs> you're dead. Dead fish float downstream. You don't say that, man, that fish is just really struggling right now. You know, he's just so sad. (gasps) Now, God does something that starts to awaken within us. Now, God does put conscience in all men. It's why people are without excuse. But there's something that gets awakened in us. And these things become ugly to us. And not only do those things become ugly to us, you know what else? Holiness becomes attractive to us desirable to us. Charles Spurgeon said the following, when the Spirit makes us hate sin, when he makes us love everything that is pure and good, when he helps us to conquer ourselves, when he leads us to love our fellow men, when he fashions us to be like Christ, this is the witness of the Spirit with our spirit that we are the children of God. Oh, to have more and more of it. See what he's saying? The Spirit leads us to start to hate sin and leads us to start to love God and the things that are important to God. Which, by the way, is our fellow man who's made in the image of God. Everybody's made in the image of God. Not that he's been saved by Christ, but everybody's made in the image of God. Everybody has dignity. Everybody has worth. Right? We see all people, without exception, created in the image of God. And that informs how we think and treat them. Now, folks, when I say this, there's news in this that we have to keep count of. 
That doesn't mean we're absolutely successful or completely victorious, victorious in the battle. It just means we battle. See, this is one of the ways that I believe Satan torment me. If you're a Christian, why do you keep sinning? And why do you do some of the same sins over and over again? And so what's that merely mean about your confession of sin? What's that merely mean about your asking the forgiveness of sin? What's that really mean about your repentance of sin? When you ask over and over again and you still do the same thing. Well, actually, you're not sincere. You don't mean any of the things you've said. And why don't you mean those things that you've said and confessed and asked for forgiveness for when you know you're just going to do them? Because you're not really a Christian. And that was a spinning circle that I was stuck in that brought great torment. And some of it's because I didn't understand the indwelling sin that remains in us. But there was something that now I see much better. Oh, yeah, I... I I'm hating my sin. I'm learning to hate sin. I'm seeking to kill sin. I I am desiring to follow God and holiness has become more attractive to me. But I'm not still absolutely successful. I'm not completely victorious. But I'm not content just to sin. There's a battle. My soul becomes disquieted. When sin starts to function, and there's something that says, this is, this is wrong. I don't want to go down this path. And so there's a battle now. And I think, oh, Lord, the battle is part of the evidence that your spirit's within me and that I'm your child. That battle becomes an evidence of grace. So, folks, I don't know if you think this way, but the next time you're aware of your sin... Praise God when you see sin and begin to hate it. So the next time you gossip, next time you're angry, next time you sinfully judge another brother and sister, next time you lust, next time you're impatient, and you become aware of it, right, where the Spirit starts to illuminate and brings conviction to you, you can, you can start. Now, you've got to get to repentance, and there's all sorts of things involved with repentance. Godly sorrow is involved with repentance. Change of actions are, uh, are involved in repentance. Confession of sin can be involved in repentance. But you know where you can, can be involved in repentance? But you know where you can start? God, thank you that I see. And thank you that I'm not justifying it. I'm no longer sin's lawyer. <laughs> and that's what comes natural. I can defend myself well. Nobody had to teach me to do that. So when you start to see sin and hate it instead of excuse it, and then you say, oh, Lord, this sin that plagues me, this sin that I am not content with, I want to kill it. I don't want to be struggling with it anymore. I mean, folks, one of the great things of heaven is there will be no more sin. I will not be tempted to be jealous. I will not be tempted to be proud. I will not be tempted to be lustful. I will not be tempted. I think, oh, what joy that will be. And that's just the beginning of joy. See, folks, that's an evidence of the Spirit. That's an evidence that you are saved. So, what does the Spirit want to do? The Spirit wants to bear witness that we are children of God. The Spirit leads us into our war against our sin. And then third, final point is this. The Spirit leads us to cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit leads us to cry, Abba, Father. Folks, we begin to know God's love through the Spirit. We begin to know God's love through the Spirit. Listen to what it says in Romans 5, uh, 5b. It says the following. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We really need the Holy Spirit. We must have sound doctrine or we will thwart and distort the Holy Spirit, but we need the Holy Spirit. God's love is poured in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And what's that Spirit do? He leads us to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, how does God's love pour out in our hearts? How do we know that? 
Well, if you looked at Romans 5, 5, you just have to look down a couple verses to Romans 5, 8, where it says this, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for potential. He didn't die for cuteness. He died for sinners. He died for people who didn't deserve him to die for. It was his choice. And he was glad to make that choice. That's amazing. God himself would send his son to die for your sins. Why would God do that for me? Who have lived in disregard to God much of my life. And even after I get saved, will the time still live in disregard to God? As children can do to parents. Children don't live in a constant state of, wow, thank you for bringing me into this world. I owe you everything. You have provided for me. You have cared for me. You birthed me. You changed diapers. You stayed up at nights with me. Thank you. I mean, mom and dad, you are amazing people. Everything in your heart is for my good. I mean, how could I not love you every moment of my life? Right? Children say that to your parents, and you'll bring them to an early grave. Because they'll just die. Like, oh, (laughs) you know, what possessed my child right now? And down they'll go. And you'll get an inheritance. Um, So they win because they're now in heaven and not with you. (laughs) So, Right? That's... Folks, God loves us. He pours his life. And where do we see? Where did that love? How's that love? Folks, this is where you don't wait for an emotional experience. This, this spirit, so I'm not sitting there saying, I'm walking around, and I'm going to hope the spirit makes me feel something. Look to the cross and let the spirit have you experience something. Look to truth. Look to a fact. Look to that. To that glorious Calvary cross where Christ died for your sins. Folks, God pours out his love for us. He shows us his love through the cross. And then you know what happens in us? We begin to love God. And there's something in our spirit that begins to cry out, Abba, Father. Listen to the following quote from John Piper who says this, The reason Paul uses the word cry and the Aramaic word Abba is because both of them point to deep, affectionate, personal, authentic experience of God's fatherly love. He didn't say that the testimony of the Spirit was that we would affirm doctrinally that God is Father. The devil knows that doctrine. Doctrinal affirmations, as important as they are, and they are Vitally important. If you get them wrong, you get it wrong. Doctrinal affirmations, as important as they are, don't make children. We don't infer logically the fatherhood of God from the testimony of the Spirit. We enjoy emotionally the fatherhood of God by the testimony of the Spirit. It is the power by which we delight in being the children of God. God pours his love into us through his Spirit And then we start to cry out, even in desperate moments. And folks, you can have desperate moments, but when there's a cry, God, my Father. This is where the Psalms is so good for us. David is in desperate moments. I mean, he's anointed king of Israel. He's the Davidic king, and this is the the guy. His line, the importance of that. And you have David anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel, a singer of songs, a man after God's own heart. And yet his life, his son tries to kill him. He escapes from his life. I mean, there's thing after thing that comes upon him. And what do we see him do in the Psalms? He cries out to God. There's something that God in his heart say, that's God, I know him as sovereign and good, and I know he loves me, so why? Why are some of these things taking place? But his, his inclination was, oh, but Father, even though he didn't say that, he cried out to God. The cross brings us to cry out, Abba. That's an intimate term, folks. Daddy's the closest we come to. This Lord of hosts, this God Almighty, 
is Abba. Affection. Intimacy. Closeness. And it's a cry. It's not a statement. It's a cry. These are important words. And folks, when we know that, when we start to cry out, Abba, Father, when you have that, you will have great assurance. So please, the next time you are convicted of sin, start with that as being an evidence and assurance that you belong to God. That will actually empower your repentance. (laughs) Because you won't think, I have to repent in order to earn God's approval. You'll repent because you already have God's approval. You're not earning God's love like a slave would earn favor because of obedience. You have it because you're God's son. You're not a slave. Relationship's not based on obedience that way. It's not that obedience is not important, but it's not based on that. You will have great assurance. And folks... Not only will you have great assurance, it puts life into perspective. So now when sufferings come, oh, there's a greater, there is a greater reality in my life than this life. There's a greater reality. Folks, we'll all experience to some degree tragedy. Maybe it's sudden, horrific, like we just saw yesterday. But the reality is we'll all die. And we're all going to know someone we love who dies. And yet this changes reality. Yeah, that's true, but God loves me and I belong to him. And that's that, oh, that puts life in perspective. We have great assurance. Life gets perspective. And you know what? We'll want to tell others about this good news. This news can drive you to evangelism. This is so good. I know God as my Abba Father. I want others to know the same thing. I want them to understand there's a God in heaven who can love you like this and be with you through the dark night of your soul. And you can cry out to this God in any trial, Abba Father, and he, he will answer. He will answer. I have the worship team join me, and let's pray. Lord, what was shared this morning is a spiritual truth, and therefore we need the Spirit to help us. God, I pray that the cry of Abba, Father, would grow in our heart. Lord, that we would understand the depth, the depths of the level of acceptance and affection that we have from you because of Christ. Not because of us. Not because we've cleaned up our act. Not because we've done good deeds. Not because we're kind to others. Not because we do good things socially. Not because we care for the poor. But, Lord, because you have set affection on us and you've purchased us to belong to you. God, I pray that for those that have placed faith in Christ, that great assurance would come to them. Well, the next time they are convicted of sin, that they would see that as an evidence of the Spirit's work in them. That that the Spirit is leading them into war against their own sin. And the sins that they used to be okay with, they're not okay with. And Lord, even when we try to silence our conscience, it it speaks because you are empowering it. So Lord, even disquiet of our soul can be an evidence that we are sons and daughters, that we are your children. And God, thank you that you hold us and hold us fast. You do. Whether we are doing well or doing poorly, whether we are in a season of prosperity or adversity, whether we are in a season of faith that just feels strong and triumphant, or even a season of doubt, and we feel weak. God, that you don't change. So may your spirit fill us And may our spirit join in with your spirit and may the cry, Abba, Father, 
be empowered through the filling of your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.